Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're continuing on with trying to get the rest of our second pass herbicide done on our beans. We knocked off a majority of our dicamba within the last two weeks. Of course we were jumping through hoops with the weather, the wind, dodging rains. We had to get the wind out of the perfect direction so we were not spraying towards a sensitive crop. Fortunately for us, the stars aligned on every single one of our fields and we got that product applied and for the most part, all of our broadleaf weeds in those fields are already dead. There are very few things in life that can really compare to the feeling of seeing a water hemp plant touching the ground. Child being born, graduating high school, your first legal drink. Never gets old seeing our arch nemesis dead. As I mentioned in the last video, the reason we apply that first is because of all those restrictions for safely and properly applying it to our fields in a legal manner. Not all of our soybean acres though are dicamba tolerant only. We have a few acres of Extinflex beans we're still working on and all of our enlist beans yet to spray. Usually when you're applying a chemical with the level of potency that dicamba products have, you'd honestly like to push it back as far as possible because you know it's going to kill those very challenging weeds that other herbicides struggle with. Due to all those restraints though, it's just not possible. Just a little bit ago, Dad and I did some scouting on a few fields of those Extinflex soybeans that we just cannot get away with spraying dicamba. The neighbors are planting sensitive soybeans all around us. As good as that dicamba product is, we just don't think it's worth the risk to damage our neighbor's crops. On other fields where we're not surrounded by all of those different sensitive crops, we went ahead and did that. These last two fields of Extinflex soybeans though, we are going to take advantage of that Liberty tolerance, not use the dicamba. On these two fields, we are going to be applying Liberty or glufosinate, which is its chemical name. It is a group 10 glutamine synthetase inhibitor. Essentially, how glufosinate works is that it inhibits the production of glutamine, which is an essential amino acid, by inhibiting that enzyme. You probably could have taken a wild guess based on the herbicide group's name alone. That's how it works. It's not the best herbicide out there. It's actually kind of wishy-washy. It has very particular conditions it likes to be applied into for maximum efficacy. There are two major negatives about this chemistry, which make it a little bit more challenging. First and foremost, it is a contact herbicide, not systemic like a lot of the other products we use. Being a contact only herbicide versus systemic herbicides like Roundup, Dicamba, Enlist, all these other products we're using, this essentially means that it's only going to do damage to weeds where it makes contact. Systemic herbicides differ because the plant uptakes the chemical, it goes through the entire plant and can cause damage all the way through the structure. That is more of a Trojan horse type approach, whereas we're just using brute force here to hopefully kill off enough plant tissue that these weeds cannot survive. That is a very large problem with this chemistry. One thing applicators do to counteract this is to use a very high carrier volume of water. Most products you can get away with 15 gallons per acre, give or take. On this product, you want 20 gallons per acre minimum, if not 25. The more plant surface that you can cover is more tissue that you're going to kill or hopefully kill. And with all the water hemp we deal with, we need all of the help we can get. The second consideration with the glufosinate chemistry is that it is extremely sensitive to the climate or the weather conditions in the field. I've heard it joked about a few times before that glufosinate works on baker's hours, so it only wants to work during the prime of the day. For optimal performance, it wants warm weather and bright sunlight. Now, almost all herbicides are more effective when they have these conditions, but Liberty and glufosinate seem to be an outlier compared to the rest. If you want maximum weed termination out here, it really needs to be applied when it's bright and sunny, it's warm, which means the plants are growing. I'm not going to pretend to fully understand the intricacies of why this is. I would speculate that it just works best when it can starve these plants of that essential amino acid, why they have a very high level of metabolism going on. And when it's warm and sunny outside, you know these plants are growing and metabolizing a lot of nitrogen. And the more of that nitrogen you can keep from being turned into glutamine, the less chance the plant has of surviving. Maybe someone who is more familiar with that product can chime in in the comments below. Correct me if I'm wrong, that's just kind of my line of thought with that. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have to spray Liberty. This is more of a backup plan that is available with those Extinflex soybeans. Dicamba is just a better herbicide, although very problematic. I guess in a perfect world, we probably wouldn't have to apply any herbicides at all, but nothing seems to work that way. I failed to mention that Liberty is a non-selective herbicide, so it will harm both grasses and broadleafs, although its effectiveness on grass is actually pretty low. A lot of people that are applying just Liberty like to throw in a clethodim or some kind of grass killer in. We're throwing in 32 ounces of Roundup with our 36 ounces of Liberty. We're hoping that they will synergize together and offer a double-edged sword to cut these water hemp to the ground. I've 
heard very differing opinions on this tank mix though. Some people claim that using Roundup antagonizes the Liberty. Other people claim it's synergistic. We put the Roundup in, so I guess we'll see here in a couple weeks what works and what doesn't. Most of the weeds out here are small though. Out in the field, there's really not that much weed pressure as of yet. On the edges though, we do have some water hemp popping up. Honestly, that's a lot taller than you'd like it to be to spray Liberty. Realistically, on areas like this, Liberty needs all the help it can get to burn these weeds down. Out in the field, we won't have near as much weed pressure. If anything, the water hemp is one, maybe two inches tall. I'm really hoping that in a couple weeks that these are all dead and I don't have to come back out here and walk this with a knife. When there's one water hemp, there's a thousand of them. We also have some cuckleburr growing out here. Roundup will fry that, no problem. The Roundup will not phase any of this water hemp though. Speaking of the devil, there's the sprayer rig right there. He's already wrapped this field with Liberty and Roundup. He's starting the long rows. Hopefully we get a lot of these weeds killed. As a person who operates a 40 foot planter in the spring, it really makes me jealous how many acres the sprayer can cover per hour. It's not even close to me in the planter. I'd be out here for four hours planting this field. He's gonna be done in 45 minutes. Even if we could spray dicamba out here, I think it would be a little bit too windy today to apply any of that stuff or at least not legally. Thankfully, when both of these two fields of Liberty are finished up, the rest of our beans are Enlist. I'm much more confident in Enlist's ability to take down big weeds. With Liberty, I'm maybe 80%, maybe 85% confident that it'll kill these weeds. Enlist is 99%, as long as it doesn't get rain on it within the hour and wash it off. The reason we had to go scout this morning is we actually had more rain over the weekend. Some of our farms had close to an inch of precipitation, which is pretty nice for this time of the year. I know a lot of areas, northern Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, western and northern Iowa, maybe the Dakotas, and Minnesota are really dry. There's some very big concerns about drought. However, we seem to be in a garden spot here, and I'm not saying that to brag, we're just very lucky this season as to the weather we've had, with the exception of that three to four to five inch rain. Don't worry though, Mother Nature definitely keeps a tally. For every good year we have, Iowa has two. This moisture did not come without a cost though. Because it was a pop-up storm, high humidity and heat that day, we actually had a little bit of wind with it and some of our corn had some standability issues. Don't mind me, just in shoulder high corn out here. Growing pretty fast. When this happened two days ago, we were really concerned with one of our fields. There was a ton of corn out here that was down. Our biggest concern with that was that the corn may have snapped off. If it snaps off at the bottom at this stage, it's done for. However, if it just lodges over, it should stand back up. We're out here today doing a little bit of scouting to see how it's fared. I'm in an area of the field right now that was completely flat. The planter was split with two different hybrids. It appears that one of the hybrids was a little bit more susceptible to the wind at this stage than the other. I'm not entirely sure which one was which. It was a Pioneer versus a DeKalb corn. For those of you who are familiar with the seed corn industry, I'm sure you could take a guess at which one did it. If you don't believe it was a hybrid thing, just take a look at this picture. Very clear evidence that certain strips of the field, 24 rows at a time is what it would amount to, had a lot more down corn than others. Now, on the bright side, what was once lost is now found. You can see that this corn was laid over pretty severely, but just in the last day, it has angled itself back up, put on a little bit of an elbow, and is growing straight. So we shouldn't see any kind of a yield loss. That's a big relief because we were biting our nails worrying about this corn. A lot of it had blown over. Now, I'm not trying to say that the other hybrid was flawless. I think right here is the dividing line between the two different hybrids. You can see that this one is down as well. Not as bad, but compared to its counterpart, it's fared a little bit better. I think you can make out the difference here in the video of the canopy height and maybe even the color or shade of the corn. Different hybrids, different standability but we did have some unusual problems out here in this field. These last two to three weeks, we've had very warm temperatures, which are conducive to a massive amount of growth once the corn gets a hold of its nitrogen and other fertilizers. Well, that's exactly what happened. This corn has pretty much taken off. I would say two to three weeks ago, it was knee high, and in some places of the field, the corn is actually shoulder high. It isn't in this specific spot, I wouldn't expect it to be though because it was touching the ground two days ago. When you combine an abundance of above ground mass accumulation in a short period of time with very poor or light root development from wet conditions earlier on the season, which this field has very wet feet and loose soil, you tend to run into root lodging issues. And that's exactly what we saw out here. The corn just does not have the root development yet to hold up all this above ground mass. Fortunately though, I think we're gonna be all right. At the very least though, someone was definitely looking out for us the corn blew over with the rose. 
as opposed to across the rows, which is, makes harvesting a complete pain in the rear end. Now we can just pick straight down and not have to worry about it. And I'm just now noticing possibly a little bit of hail damage. You see a punch hole here. That's a sign that a hailstone went through there, punched the leaf out. Really not gonna do much financial damage at this point. We have so much leaf area. I mean, look at the size of that leaf out here. It's just absolutely incredible how fast corn can grow. It is so efficient. I think if we continue to have these same growing conditions, our corn will probably be tasseled and pollinated within the next month. Pretty impressive. That row got the twister treatment. Some of it's blown that way, some's that way, some's back towards me. You know when the storm is headed to the southeast and you come out to check on it as it's happening and you're getting a wind to the northeast, that you've got a pretty bad situation on your hands. If we had a wind like this right around tassel time, we'd probably have a field full of green snap. I guess I shouldn't jinx us because we haven't gotten there yet. Where does that put us now on our checklist? We've had frost, flood, hail, and now wind. We're just waiting on locusts, fires, earthquake maybe, end of the world apocalypse, something. You think crop insurance still pays in an apocalypse? The areas of this field that are well drained are pretty much shoulder height. I'm holding the camera right around my jawline and you're running into leaves. You love to see it smothering out those weeds, putting those roots down. We're on track for a good crop, except for where the side dress bar runs. That crop never amounts to much. Right now I'm headed to meet up with my dad. Supposedly we have a new corn head being delivered today. What that means is we need to get our head cart out that we're going to put this corn head on. That is down at the barn and up buried behind another new piece of harvesting equipment. So we're gonna have to drive over there and move that around real quick. And hopefully that corn head will actually show up this afternoon. Speaking of new equipment, we just picked this up last week. 735 FD John Deere Flex Draper. 35 foot versus the 30 we had before. We've got on our nice new heavy head cart. We're just doing a little bit of a shuffle to get this other head cart out. I will say that backing up these all-wheel steer head carts are a whole new level of challenging compared to just the front axles that articulate. Back and forth. Back and forth. I think I'm about to jackknife it. Well, Seems like we're going nowhere fast with that. Doesn't help with the all-wheel steer. Can you get like this? We can hook onto it and just push it back. We're really hooking up to the 735. To the. Trying to get it deeper into the barn out of the way. I'm trying to drive minimally. It's a tight squeeze. Doesn't look like I can really get out. Unless we want to hang the door. The irony, a fully capable person is in here driving the truck and the handicapped man is hooking up the head guards. Dad's putting his little hobby mowing tractor back in the shed over here. We've got the new 735 flex draper. We've got our older 630 FD in the back. It's gonna stay here, but in the future, we're gonna shift it from that smaller head cart to another one of these heavier ones. We just like the way they drive and hold the weight better. And now our corn heads are gonna have the luxury of not being stored on dirt. They're gonna be on these two head carts or this one and the one the 630's on. Probably not quite heavy enough for a corn head, but we don't do much roading with the head on the cart. Most of it's on the combine. Last week, we got the 670 out and the 608C that we're trading off on a newer corn head. There's really no way you can move a corn head as good as you can with a combine. So we got that out. And as a matter of fact, we're actually going to be taking it into our local John Deere dealership here in the next week or so for them to service it and get it ready for next season. There's nothing quite as nice as waiting for it to be 95 degrees to take your combine through the country into town. There'll be a little road oil involved, I would imagine. My duck moved. I don't know if he was trying to leave with the corn head or what? The main reason the boss decided to trade this corn head in for a newer one is that it was starting to get a lot of acres on it. These corn heads see some pretty gruesome and maybe not the best conditions for long-term sustainability of your frame and other moving parts. He was having a lot of trouble with the snap and roll gearboxes. We're having continuous issues with having to call service tech out, replace those that were going bad all across the head, and they didn't seem to last too long. The newer series of Cornhead is supposed to be built a little bit better, so we think it's gonna have a longer life than this one did. I've been waiting out here all afternoon, and I would say that there must have been some kind of miscommunication between dad and the dealership who was supposed to be bringing the Cornhead because it never showed up. Maybe tomorrow? 
Well, it's Tuesday and I'm starting to think maybe that cornhead is not gonna be showing up at all this week. I would venture to say that that was probably my dad's fault versus the dealership we're working with. Who knows though, we really need to get that corn head off so we can take that S670 into town and get it serviced and ready to go for next fall. Until then though, we're getting geared up to haul some more corn. This will be my first time back behind the wheel of the semi in quite a while. I spent the bulk of what would be our normal hauling season in the winter running the backhoe digging out trees while Jeff was just chugging away on moving our grain around. So he did most of the work and I'm just coming here to finish up the last three bins with him. Although it was a few months ago, I do remember that the last time I was in this truck, a mouse had died somewhere and had left quite the stench behind. Doesn't smell as bad now, but I'm gonna throw this up somewhere. Maybe get us a friendlier set of scents here in the track cab. It's gonna be a beautiful day to drive with the windows down. And I don't really have a choice because my air conditioner does not work. There's our cornfield that was flat. Doesn't look bad. Oh, Jeff's about loaded. Perfect timing. He's getting out of the way for us. Pretty nice watching unsold grain go the elevator right now. Now this is the hard part. Because I'm not even close to lock up right. Centered. That is closed. That is also closed. You can never be too certain when you haven't hauled in a while. It only takes me a couple days to forget something, let alone if I left one of those hoppers open three months ago. And now we wait. It shouldn't be that bad though. This backhoe conveyor can absolutely devour the corn out of the out auger, maybe out of here in 10 to 15 minutes, which is pretty quick for loading out of a grain bin. Yeah, I haven't quite lost my touch. It's gonna be a nice load on this truck. I had forgotten though, how nice it is to get corn dust up your nose. I'm gonna have it in there for weeks now. If I don't sneeze a thousand times in the next hour, this time of year is really interesting for the grain markets. We are still dealing with very high prices. For both corn and soybeans, we're probably 40, 50, 60% above the long term average price. So the grain market is strong. What makes this time of year interesting is that the United States is in a very sensitive time of its growing season for both corn and soybean. If we get too much rain, don't get enough grain, don't get everything planted, get a massive windstorm, anything of that sort, it is going to negatively affect our crop. And on the contrary, if we have ideal conditions across the Corn Belt, we could have an above trend line yield crop, which would be excellent in terms of supply. A weather market in the earlier portion of a growing season in the United States is not uncommon by any means, but this year has a whole nother level of volatility tied into it. We are still looking at very tight global supplies. The production around the world the last few years didn't quite amount to what we thought it had, and we're actually looking at very strong demand. Prices have crept up though, and that does ration demand downward. Sorry, I gotta check every now and then to make sure the truck's not running over. On top of all that, you sprinkle in a drought in the northern side of the Corn Belt, in the western side of the Corn Belt, and let's just say the market's making pretty big moves every day, just based on weather forecasts alone. If the Western Corn Belt gets a big rain, that's going to bring our prices down. And if the forecast looks dry, it's going to move it up. But we're just seeing moves like this back and forth pretty regularly all week, which is pretty stressful when you have grain unsold. Maybe I'm being a little bit dramatic when I say stressful. We're still looking at very friendly prices. Almost 650 cash corn right now for old crop delivery. So this maybe 1,000 bushel load of corn is worth 6,500 bucks. Whereas two years ago, three years ago, you have been lucky to get $3,500 for it. Everyone handles their own grain marketing different. Some people have been long sold on the old crop corn. They don't store it for as long as we do. Other people are more focused on new crops. So selling ahead what we have out in the fields. Different strokes for different folks. If the weather was this nice every day I hauled, this would be my favorite job. However, that's not the case and I don't enjoy hauling that much. But today's an exception to that rule. Only took about seven or eight minutes and we are at TGM and Yoga, which is just right south of our farm. Pretty big elevator. We're gonna go way in. 
This facility as a whole can probably store over 2 million bushels of grain. Most of it's loaded out on rail, but we're just in the middle of central Illinois. When I talk to farmers in different areas of the Corn Belt, it amazes me, or I guess it amazes them, how much local commercial storage is available here in the heart of the Corn Belt. All right, we weighed in, we weighed out, we dumped, we're headed home. Our final bushels on the truck was 963, so I was about 40 off of 1,000. We really don't want to get that high up in weight because these trailers can legally only hold so much weight based on the various laws here in Illinois. If I drew a circle with a 20 mile radius around our farm, you probably have 15 million bushels of grain storage in the area. We seem to have a pretty robust infrastructure when it comes to grain handling, which would make sense because there's a lot of foreign grown in this area. I'm just going to slowly grind away hauling grain. If you need anything, you know where to find me. Right there. Like a good place to sit down. Fantastic news, everyone. I've been temporarily relieved of my trucking duties because the corn head is supposed to be coming in soon. I figured while we wait was the perfect time to top off the def in my truck. I don't want to run into the same fiasco I did last time where I was limited to almost five miles an hour. So, probably should keep it full. Oh, it's coming down the road right now. In a hurry. Ah, there it is. The brand new John Deere C8R Cornhead. C8R is just the new 608 and 708C. Let's see if Dad can get this up to the right the first time. I'm standing far away because with his foot in the boot, there's really no question or guessing what's going to happen up there in the combine. Not that he's any better when he has both legs operational. He's got the head. Oh! Got off their trailer, now we're sitting on the ground. Ooh, look how shiny it is. Just picked up the 608C that's leaving the farm. Time to load it onto Sloan's trailer. This cornhead's been on our farm for eight or nine seasons now. Bought it brand new. Man, I always pick the right place to work. They're folding up the cones for road travel, and I just get to sit in the combine. And that'll be its last time on our farm right there. About to head out. Oh. Silliest thing with these tier four motors. I mean, this must have been regening. It was the worst time. Well, as opposed to wait for this to cool off, I'm gonna go ahead and just take it into town to get serviced. New corn head, new draper. All that's left to complete the trifecta is a new combine. Wouldn't that be nice? Farewell, corn head. It's been fun. Kind of. Not for me. Oh, I'm liable to pull this dead tree limb over on me. That. You may disagree, but there's really no better to take a combine down the road than 2 o'clock in the afternoon when it's close to 90 degrees, the sun's been shining all day, and they just put rock down on top of oil. Actually, just kidding. It's a terrible time to take it down the road. I'm not even going full speed because I don't want to get road oil and rocks all over this combine. We have arrived, and I would say we're not the only people having our combine serviced this summer. Combines are the worst machine to take down the road. They're just so cumbersome, but they're extremely quiet. So at least the ride's enjoyable when you're bumping around the road. The whole reason we brought the combine in as opposed to waiting until it was a little cooler outside was because it was needing to sit for 10 minutes to cool off from doing its depth filter cleaning deal, whatever it is. And I get into a Lions tractor and Matt too, and it tells me the same thing. It's got to sit here for 10 minutes and cool off before I can shut it off or it will damage the components. My butt's about to be damaged from this heated seat. I always forget that dad leaves it on and by the time I remember it's too late and I'm already sweating. I guess conditions are finally right and cooled down enough that I could shut it off. We'll see it when it gets serviced. I think the engineers at the John Deere Harvester Works knocked this corn head out of the park. It just looks sweet. The way they shaped all the fairings on it. I believe they made some changes with the auger dimensions. Maybe did some kind of work, redesigned a few other parts to make them last a little bit longer. Other than that though, it's just a simple eight row corn head on 30 inch spacing. It's non chopping, but it does have the factory installed stock stompers. And those stands are a plus too, so we don't have to take the stock stompers off when we put the corn head on the ground. I can see that being an issue if it was muddy though, having this thing buried in the ground. They did some simplification too, because the last corn head had a drive shaft on both sides, whereas this one just comes off of the left side. Hopefully it's a pretty good rig. We are gonna have to make some adjustments though to get this corn head to sit on that trailer. 
that's a project for a different day, especially because the combine went to town. For now though, we don't have to worry about it because we have it sitting in such a good spot. It's somewhat out of the way, but it's inconvenient enough that we will have to move it at some point. I'm looking forward to having to service one less corn head this year. The other one will need some love, but this one ought to be running like a champ. I'm glad that that corn head finally showed up. The suspense was killing me. I was afraid that this was going to be the episode that never end because I was trying to show our new harvesting equipment and it wasn't showing up. So you got a sneak peek of that. I'm excited to see that in action. By the end of the evening today, Nutrien is going to have all of our second pass soybean herbicide applied. They finished the last field of Liberty this morning and now they're working on our Enlist acres. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about that. Enlist is a group four herbicide. It is a synthetic auxin, very similar to dicamba, but also very different. A much safer and simpler herbicide to apply with very similar efficacy to dicamba. Now you can only apply that on Enlist beans. Enlist beans are tolerant to this Do4D variant, Liberty, and Roundup. It is a great technology. We're just waiting to see if the yield is there yet to compete with these new Extend genetics. Based on what we've seen last year on our farm and a lot of data, they're pretty darn close to their competitors. Once all that chemical is applied, we pretty much get to sit back and relax and watch our crop grow. Now we do have a few interesting trials going on across the farm. When prices are this high, it gives you a lot of room to play around in your budget to maybe try out individual chemicals, chemistries, micronutrients, or biologicals to see if they have a return on investment and if they can offer some kind of a positive return to your farm. We are trialing a few different things across the farm. I'll talk about that at a later date. That's gonna be it for this episode. And unfortunately for me, I have a date with a semi and a sweet auger tomorrow. So hopefully it's not too warm. Thank you all for tuning in. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you wanna see more and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day everyone. Peace.